Hello, everyone, and uh, welcome to this webinar on corruption and human rights sanctions in Australia. What to expect? My name is Anton Moisenko, and I'm a lecturer in law at the Australian National University. Before we properly begin, can I take a moment to acknowledge the traditional owners of the land on which ANU stands and pay respect to elders past, present, and those emerging? The subject of our discussion today is the upcoming introduction of corruption and human rights sanctions in Australia. These sanctions are also often known among their proponents as Magnitsky sanctions. We will talk about the current state of play, the potential impact of those sanctions, and the vexed matter of due process. And we could not have a better group of people with us today to talk us through some of those issues. I will introduce them shortly, but first several words about the context for today's discussion. When we talk about targeted sanctions, we tend to refer to asset freezes and travel bans that are imposed by governments with only retrospective oversight by judicial authorities. That's to say, these sanctions are not imposed by courts, but by the executive. And over the past decade or so, we have seen a significant shift in how these sanctions are being utilized by a number of countries. And I'm referring to the increased recourse to these kinds of sanctions to clamp down on individuals, especially foreigners, suspected of involvement in significant corruption or gross human rights violations. The first law of that nature was the Magnitsky Act 2012, adopted in the United States to bring some measure of accountability to a number of Russian officials involved in the maltreatment and tragic death of Sergei Magnitsky, a Russian tax accountant who reported a massive fraud that had been perpetrated against the Russian state budget and then was himself put in prison and sadly died there. The original Magnitsky Act 2012 was only focused on human rights abuse in Russia, but a subsequent piece of legislation in the United States, the Global Magnitsky Act, extended the same principle to all countries in the world so that a person from any country could be sanctioned. And it also included corruption in addition to human rights abuse as a reason for imposing sanctions. In Australia, in 2020, the Joint Parliamentary Standing Committee on Foreign Affairs, Defence and Trade conducted an inquiry that recommended that Australia too should join the growing ranks of countries with some form of Magnitsky legislation. And these countries include now, in addition to the US, Canada, the UK and a couple of others. After the report was published, for some time, for close to a year, it seemed as though nothing much was happening. But in August this year, the Minister for Foreign Affairs, Marie Spain, committed to introducing a corruption and human rights sanctions regime in Australia, as well as announcing a broader inquiry into the operation of Australia's autonomous sanctions. And so Australia's framework for sanctions writ large might be reviewed as well. We don't yet know what exact form the government's proposal for reform will take, so there might be a degree of crystal ball gazing that we'll have to indulge in today, but the experience of other countries is a helpful barometer as to the kinds of impact that sanctions can affect and also the challenges that governments tend to face in their implementation. And we're going to be focusing on both these issues today. And as I said, we could not be joined by a better group of people to have that conversation with. Uh, first, I'm delighted to welcome Jeffrey Robertson, QC. Jeffrey Robertson is a renowned barrister and author. He is the founder and joint head of Doughty Street Chambers in London. And I will not list his very many accolades, but of particular relevance to today's conversation, he has long been involved with the global Magnitsky justice campaign. He has vigorously advocated for corruption and human rights sanctions around the world. And that includes preparing a 50-page long draft law on corruption and human rights sanctions that was included in an annex to the parliamentary report that was published in 2020. Jeffrey's latest book is called Bad People and How to Be Rid of Them. And I'm not going to spoil the content for you, but I think it's fair to say that sanctions are a central part of that project of his to rid us of bad people. A rather distinguished guest, and I was going to say distinguished guest from London, but as I'm reliably informed, she is now in Sweden, is Anna Bradshaw, partner at Peters and Peters. Um, Dr. Bradshaw specializes in white collar crime and economic sanctions, and she is particularly experienced in challenges to UN and EU sanctions designations. She has worked on these issues both in UK domestic courts and in the EU general court. 
She is also an associate fellow at the Royal United Services Institute, a leading British defense and security think tank. Last but not least, our Canberra insider for today and our law enforcement expert is Dr. Adam Masters, senior lecturer in criminology at ANU and executive director at the Transnational Research Institute on Corruption. Prior to his academic career, he spent 24 years working for the Australian government, including at the Department of Defense, the Australian Taxation Office, and over 18 years in the Australian Federal Police. So a wealth of practical law enforcement experience, as well as academic insight to draw on there. I should also say on this note that this event is co-organized by ANU's College of Law and the Transnational Research Institute on Corruption that uh, Adam leads. So thank you very much to him for making this event possible. With this introduction over, I'm now going to hand over to each of our panelists in turn for approximately 10 minutes of their prepared remarks, and then we're going to have a Q&A session. So if you're in the audience today, please keep your questions coming and pop them into the Q&A function that you should be able to see on your screen. With that, I'm going to hand over to our first speaker for today, and that is Jeffrey Robertson QC for his assessment of the current state of affairs and the government's response to the parliamentary inquiry. So Jeffrey, over to you, please. Good evening. Well, I'm here to give a broad brush background to the fight for Magnitsky sanctions and to make a few comments on the government's position so far. I guess the first thing to note in the battle for delivering on the Nuremberg legacy that people who perpetrate human rights abuses will be punished in their lifetime is this, that the International Criminal Court, which was the objective of so many campaigners back in the last century and which came to fruition in 2002, has in the almost 20 years of its life not lived up to expectations. In the last 10 years, indeed, it's been uh, a court for Congo warlords. It has not, and the reason is the polarity in the Security Council. It's really polaxed, and those who wield power, the big five, include two countries, Russia and particularly China, which are not in favor of international justice, and the United States that is only occasionally in favor. So you have a situation, for example, where Assad in Syria is protected by the veto, which is cast or threatened by Russia, which needs support in his country on the Mediterranean. It's as simple, I'm afraid, as that. So the question becomes, is there a fallback? Is there a plan B? And that was found in an extraordinary event in Russia in 2009. It was a kind of George Floyd without a, the cameras. It was the uh, wrongful imprisonment and beating up in prison and death of a tax accountant for a man called an American, Bill Browder, uh, whose name was Sergei Magnitsky. And he was, well, I think it all began because Bill Browder was determined to avenge his death to expose the judges, the doctors, the police who had contributed to it. Initially, he made videos, and that's when I came into the picture as his lawyer, because he was sued in London by one of the policemen, whose salary was 15000 a year, and who stumped up a million dollars to uh, pay for lawyers to sue for libel. We got rid of that, uh, but... Bill went off to America, enlisted powerful Democrat senators and um, uh, 
Senator and John McCain, and that produced the 2012 Magnitsky Act that sanctioned individuals concerned in this particular case. Uh, interestingly enough, there were three judges, included judges who had improperly denied uh, bail to this, this particular man. There were doctors and there were prosecutors. So the whole corrupt operation, which had stolen $250 million from the Russian people, uh, the individuals who profited, and the, what I would call the train drivers to Auschwitz, people like judges and uh, doctors who assist in torture sessions and so on, judges who comply with state directives that uh, put people like Alex Navalny in prison, were included in the scope of the Magnits first Magnitsky Act. And then, as Anton has said, there was a worldwide Magnitsky Act in 2016, under which uh, the United States has sanctioned about 250 human rights perpetrators thus far. There was yeah, a, a, an act adopted by Canada, then last year by Britain, which has sanctioned 92, and also by the European Union. So if you add, and on the countries of Europe, of the European Union, you get a sum total of 31 Western democratic countries that now have Magnitsky laws. And the question we'll be discussing now that Australia has uh, stepped up to the plate, or at least pretended to, what sort of law Australia will have. Because there was a very wide-ranging inquiry by Joint Committee last year, uh, in which all sorts of groups gave evidence. There were 100 submissions. Uh, 158 of them, I think, in favor of a Magnitsky law. However, the government has produced what I suppose we call a white paper, or at least a guideline, as to what form the Australian Magnitsky law will take. Uh, I find it uh, intellectually dishonest because it keeps saying, yes, we accept what the Joint Committee recommended. But, of course, it doesn't. When you read it, you find that almost all the innovative suggestions by the Joint Committee are rejected. The problem is that in order to have, and, and well, most of you know the basis of Magnitsky laws. It's to name, blame, and shame perpetrators of human rights abuses, to stop them and their families from coming into Australia, to uh, keep their money here, and so on. So although they're not prison sanctions of the kind that the International Criminal Court can impose, uh, they are inconvenient. Uh, indeed, they can be uh, extremely inconvenient. In America and Britain has sanctioned, for example, the parastatal that makes the money from the slave labor contributed by the Uyghurs in China to its cotton. And that cotton is bought by the fashion houses of the West and no longer the Magnitsky sanction has deterred all, I think, except Hugo Boss, <laughs> keeping up its tradition. Hugo Boss made, of course, the uniforms for the concentration camps, uh, and it's still, it's the only major fashion house that now, thanks to Magnitsky sanctions, uh, purchases the cotton, slave labor cotton. So there is an impact. Uh, they can range from that 
impact of that seriousness to Carrie Lam, uh, who was uh, found that once sanctioned by America, she couldn't use her bank cards, even those from Hong Kong banks, and she had to take her salary home in cash. Many millions of Hong Kong dollars uh, kept under her bed, and she complained loudly on social media at the inconvenience of having her home uh, stacked with Hong Kong dollars, and this provided some at least amusement for her victims of um, her efforts to curb democracy in Hong Kong. So there are consequences. They're not prison consequences, but they can be serious, particularly for those involved in significant corruption who find that they can't do business uh, anymore because they've been put on an American, particularly, sanctioned list. Well, where are we in Australia? The Joint Committee said, yes, we should step up to the plate and have a, not a Magnitsky Act. <laughs> it was amusing that uh, they shy DFAT, which produced this rather weasley document, uh, would not accept the name Magnitsky, although it's associated with the law, it's part of the law in America and Canada and in Britain when the sanctions law was passed last year, the Magnitsky family was specially invited uh, to watch Parliament do so. But no, DFAT doesn't want the name attached and it doesn't want a Magnitsky law. It merely wants a tinkering with the existing Sanctions Act, which is called the Autonomous, well, I better get this right. It is called the Autonomous Sanctions Act of 2011. And it's an incredibly cumbersome, quite ridiculous piece of legislation that requires, first of all, not individuals, but countries to be singled out. Only two countries have been singled out, Syria and uh, Zimbabwe, I think. And then individuals can be sanctioned. And for the first 10 years of the act, the only people that we sanctioned were Syrian uh, generals. So it's unwieldy. It requires, uh, it's clumsy. And no one supported it in the submissions to the Joint Committee. No one except DFAT, which wants a quiet life, which doesn't want the minister embarrassed. And what DFAT uh, really uh, insists upon is secrecy. And this is really contradictory to the principles. The basic error, in my view, in DFAT's response is that they misunderstand the whole purpose of the Magnitsky Act. In their 16-page document, 12 times they repeat this phrase as if it were a mantra. Australian autonomous sanctions are a foreign policy tool used in pursuit of foreign policy goals. Just think about that. These sanctions ought to be human rights tools used in pursuit of human rights goals. But DFAT isn't interested in human rights. They don't mention human rights. It's purely a foreign policy tool. And that, I think, is the mistake at the heart of the Australian government response. The Joint Committee, aware that sanctions would only be credible if they were imposed on the recommendation of an independent body with human rights experts, recommended exactly that. Oh, no, says DFAT, we mustn't have any independence involved. 
world, the sanctions must be uh, entirely come from within the department. We can't have the Australian public concerned with the <laughs> Australian foreign policy, let alone Australia's response to human rights. And I've copied a few <laughs> being, being uh, well aware of the Sir Humphrey mentality from the English uh, civil service. I note that in the docu in DFAT's document, they're horrified at the prospect of an independent committee, which would, I quote, facilitate unlimited debate. <laughs> Perish that thought, the idea that there should be unlimited debate about uh, human rights. Or, and I quote, diminish ministerial discretion. In other words, by exposing the minister to ideas outside her department. So I think the problem is going to be, and when the bill is introduced, it will merely be tinkering with the Autonomous Sanctions Act. When the bill will be introduced, there will be efforts, I know, from politicians, particularly those who heard the evidence from the Joint Committee, uh, to inject an element of independent assessment in the question of who or what should be sanctioned. Unless that is introduced, there will not be credibility. There are other problems, and because this is, and I stress this, it's at a very early stage. We started the exercise only 10 years ago, and of course there are many questions about how we cohere with other countries, the 31 countries uh, about to be joined by Australia and Japan, the Japanese parliament is considering, and that is important because at the moment it is confined to the West, what I would call the white West, and uh, the introduction of Japan and perhaps Malaysia would be uh, very helpful. But uh, you can see that there will be problems ahead. There are other uh, questions. The Joint Committee was adamant in the right of individual sanction to take themselves off the list, but DFAT doesn't want that either. It wants the minister to have, in other words, DFAT to have a complete stranglehold on the new sanctions law. And this is contrary, I think, to the principle that the public should have access to it and should be able to make submissions to an independent body to make the recommendations. So they are my 10 minutes worth of <laughs> comments, Anton. Excellent. Thank you very much. It's always fascinating to hear how, even when a government supports a particular policy, when you look at the details, things might not necessarily turn out as straightforward as that. So thanks for that. Uh, now, we also want to discuss the place of potential corruption and human rights sanctions in the broader toolbox and how they relate to criminal justice measures that are already there available to address similar kinds of misconduct. And to help us think of those issues, I'm going to hand over to Adam. So over to you, Adam. Thank you very much, Anton, and uh, thank you for your comments as well, Geoffrey. Uh, I'll lean on some of your points as I go through. But uh, to begin with, I just wanted to say a couple of words about the Transnational Research Institute on Corruption here at ANU. Um, it was established in 2010 as a cross-disciplinary institute because uh, the founder, Professor Adam Graker, always saw corruption as um, one of those things being exciting people in the economics sphere or the development space or um, some people in law, but nobody was sort of bringing everybody together. So we've been looking at corruption um, for nearly a little over a decade now. We've got people who are anthropologists. We've got people involved in law. Myself, my, my background is, uh, my PhD is international relations, but I teach criminology now. I've got 
background working for Interpol Canberra. So we bring a range of views to looking at the problem. And for my part, Anton asked me to look at the question, you know, what's the potential contribution of corruption and human rights sanctions to Australia's existing anti-corruption measures, including criminal justice responses? Now, there were four points I wanted to make in this sphere. And Jeffrey's already eloquently made one about the uh, response DFAT's made to the Joint Standing Committee report. And that the position of government is this is a foreign policy issue, not a human rights issue, not an anti-corruption issue. It's a foreign policy issue. Now, the practitioner in me, the, the question that screams at me from this, this perspective is, whatever happened to whole of government? You know, th th that was a catch cry when I worked for government. When I worked for the federal police, we worked with DFAT. We worked with uh, what's now Home Affairs, Customs. We worked with Treasury. We worked with all sorts of people. And the federal police still do. But if you're describing and building a policy that is specific and narrow without sort of broadening the way you can look forward and being a little bit more creative with the way the policy can be applied, you end up with a very narrow approach. So I'm not enamoured of the idea of creating a sing singular foreign policy tool or even a singular human rights tool for that matter. My background from um, a law enforcement agency is, well, you know, we need to be able to do something about this in multiple ways and we should be creative, I think, a little bit in our thinking. The second point, if we're considering corruption, um, from a Magnitsky point of view, it's Magnitsky laws are operating in the international sphere. They're not national laws, so to speak. Nations pass them, of course, but they're designed to operate in the international sphere. So if they're going to capture corruption as well as human rights. And the American Act and the, and the uh, Canadian Act do address corruption as well. How do we frame corruption? Now, just to show my background preparation, I did in fact read the bill that uh, Jeffrey prepared and he gave a long definition of corruption, but what he captured in the, in the first part of what corruption should look like in any Magnitsky law in Australia, drew directly from the UN Convention Against Corruption. And I'll just go through these articles briefly, and you'll know why I'm going through them very briefly in a moment. But Article 15 is uh, calls on nation member states to outlaw the bribery of national officials. Article 16, the bribery of foreign officials. Article 17 is to outlaw embezzlement and misappropriation by public officials. Article 18, outlaws trading and influence. Um, and I'm not going to explain exactly what these are. Some of these are very American kind of terms. Um, abuse of function in article, article 19, illicit enrichment in Article 20, bribery in the private sector in Article 21, 22 is embezzlement in the private sector, and 23 is money laundering. That's essentially Chapter 3 of a UN convention. Feel free to go and read it if you're really, really interested. Um, However, how does this translate into some of the existing Magnitsky laws? Well, the US law doesn't actually define corruption at all. It is defined by executive order. Um, the previous president, who shall remain nameless, um, okay. put forward an executive order that described corruption as including misappropriation of state assets, which is Article 17, expropriation of private assets for personal gain, covers Article 19, um, corruption related to government contracts and the extraction of natural, natural resources or bribery. So it's a bit broader than simply the UN Convention Against Corruption, but bribery by itself covers Articles 15 and 16. Or transfer of facilitation uh, of the transfer of the proceeds of corruption. It's money laundering covered. What's very silent here is bribery in the private sector or trading in influence. And the Canadian um, version of the legislation actually gives a lot, nice little definition, acts of corruption, including bribery, misappropriation, transfer of proceeds of corruption, um, any act of corruption related to expropriation, covers the same spaces 
as the US legislation. We should be a little bit braver. I think we have got a real opportunity going forward to say, well, look, what about the private sector? The private sector can be involved in human rights abuses. And Jeffrey's example before of Hugo Boss is one of many. Um, the pharmaceutical industry is replete with uh, breaches of human rights, so much so that there are many African nations that actually have laws that make specifically bribery of healthcare professionals a criminal offence that carries far more severe offence, far more severe consequences than general public bribery. Now, I haven't re researched this far enough, but I suspect it's a response to the way the pharmaceutical industry has operated overseas. And from an Australian point of view, some of our corporations that operate overseas have been involved in fairly dodgy practices, to say the least. Note printing Australia and security. Um, were convicted and some of their officials were convicted for bribing foreign officials. And these were people in the private sector and they were using private agents to bribe foreign public officials. But you can quite easily see where so much of government functionality is now being outsourced to the private sector. That private to private corruption really needs to be captured in anything we do going forward. Which brings me to my third point, the existing anti-corruption measures at an international level. Now, Australia signed up to the UN Convention Against Corruption. We're signatories to the OECD Anti-Bribery Bribery Convention, which I kind of like because the OECD actually has a peer review process. And that peer review process has exposed weaknesses in Australia on a regular basis. Yes, we've passed laws, Section 70 of the Criminal Code, uh, Criminal Code Act 1995 covers foreign bribery. Great, we've got a law on the books. The AFP, in the, by the time the second review came round after we'd signed up to the convention, second peer review looked at what we'd actually been doing. And out of 27 referrals to the Australian Federal Police for foreign bribery related matters, only two had moved forward to investigation. So only a handful actually shifted from that, look, there's a crime happening to an investigation. Now I can explain that very easily. Multi-jurisdictional investigations, trying to get evidence about bribing a foreign official, quite possibly from that foreign official himself or herself, is an incredibly difficult thing to do. But having it locked in under criminal law means that we've got a um, level of proof of beyond reasonable doubt, which makes it really difficult to move on. What else is in the toolkit? Believe it or not, the Autonomous Sanctions Act is. Now, one of the recommendations that was made by the Joint Standing Committee was that targeted sanctions should not apply to Australian citizens because they're subject to legislation with similar, if not stronger, consequences. We think of foreign bribery. You've got Section 70 of the Cr Criminal Code. Fantastic. But nothing's happening with it. What if the Minister for Foreign Affairs in cons consultation with the Minister for Justice and the Attorney General recognises an Australian company has been committing acts of foreign bribery and does something like declares that foreign official a sanctioned individual and then is in a position to take action against the Australian co corporations that are involved. This is complicated and there's a whole range of rule of law matters that I'm sure Anna will pick me up on here, but I'm, I was a practitioner, not, I'm never a lawyer. But I think we could be a little bit more creative in this sort of space if we were to if we were to use existing legislation or new or build the space within existing legislation to say we're not only going to sanction the person offshore, we're going to sanction the supply side of corruption those who are paying the bribes and those in Australia who are paying the bribes. So I'll leave you with this little question, you know, could this application of harsher penalties using some sort of sanctions regime within Australia actually cut
cut that Gordian knot of the, all the complexities that surround multi-jurisdictional investigations. So thank you very much. I'll hand back to you, Anton. Excellent. Thank you very much, Adam, for all those points. Really uh, plenty of food for thought there. And thank you very much for foreshadowing Anna's presentation. Of course, the matter of uh, due process is essential as we think about sanctions. And uh, fortunately, we've got Anna to share some thoughts based on her experience. So over to you. Thank you very much, Anton, and thank you very much indeed for inviting me. It's um, an absolute pleasure to talk about something that is very close to my heart and for which I make no apologies because I am about to sound a note of caution based on the experience so far, albeit, albeit limited in the UK and to a lesser extent also based on corresponding lessons learnt under the EU sanctions regime. And I want to talk about three points in particular. I want to talk about the principled policy objections from a due process perspective that I have. Secondly, I want to talk about the due process deficit in the designation process. And finally, I will say a few words about the due process deficit in the challenging designations process. So starting with the policy objection, I do want to say that obviously I'm in favour of corruption and human rights sanctions, but I do think that there are very important points that are often skirted over or left out of the debate entirely, which um, I am here to remind you of. And I want to start with the EU's misappropriation sanctions regime, which was initially replicated in the EU for a very short period of time in a consolidated form before it was replaced with the e, sorry, UK's corruption sanctions. And these are the sanctions that the EU adopted in the wake of the Arab Spring, targeting individuals in Egypt, Tunisia, and then later following the Orange Revolution in Ukraine, individuals responsible for, or allegedly responsible for, grand corruption there as well. And in all those three regimes, the EU sanctions were intended to support national criminal investigations into public corruption. Now, there are lots of things I can say about the background and circumstances uh, of the adoption of these three misappropriation regimes, but without going into great detail, they do raise real questions about the transparency and the appropriateness of the policy decisions that led to that choice between sanctions and conventional law enforcement cooperation. So my question really is, when is it appropriate to choose sanctions above or over conventional mutual legal assistance in support of criminal proceedings. And I can see many problems with not answering this question properly. Each and every time a designation is made, at least under the corruption sanctions regime. And one such problem was recently highlighted in the US Treasury sanction review that was published earlier this month. The effectiveness of sanctions as a foreign policy and national security tool is undermined if we don't put more thought into what we're trying achieve, to achieve and choose our methods more wisely. So from the due process perspective, this is a particular concern when it comes to corruption sanctions. They are plainly a far more efficient way of freezing assets than conventional mutual legal assistance in support of criminal proceedings. That much is understood, but it comes with a hefty price tag. And the first casualty is the procedural safeguards that are built into criminal mutual legal assistance. 
This may be an aspect that is welcomed with open arms by executive policymakers, but that would be short-sighted because a due process deficit undermines the perceived legitimacy of sanctions. And the more obvious the deficit is, the deficit is, the more corrosive it becomes. And similarly, if you remove all participation by the courts or even by law enforcement in the designation process, you devalue what are serious allegations of criminal conduct and politicizing the enforcement of public corruption may prove to be an own goal in this sense. And finally, the perception that a country is more interested in pursuing public corruption abroad than at home may be equally damaging to the perceived legitimacy of sanctions as a foreign policy tool and a national security tool. These same due process objections may not apply to human rights sanctions with the same force, but I do want to point out that the UN Special Rapporteur on unilateral coercive measures has voiced very strong concerns about what she sees as the proliferation of Magnitsky style sanctions and an unhealthy lack of thought into whether such proliferation is appropriate. So my second point is the due process deficit in the designation process. Looking at the relatively short space of time that the UK has had these human rights regimes, in the case of the um, human rights regime, there have already been 72 individual designations, six entity designations. The corruption regime, even shorter lived, we've already seen 27 individual designations. So take all these together. In the space of a year, we've had almost 100 designations. So at this rate going forward, um, that's a huge amount of designations, potentially long-term. Both of these regimes in the UK were accompanied by a policy note setting out the criteria which inform designation decisions, together with a separate information note directed at NGOs and civil society. Neither of these documents were preceded by any kind of public consultation, very much like the regimes themselves. And I want to flag point five of the policy note for corruption sanctions, which is largely replicated in point seven of the human rights policy note. And I want to flag it because it suggests that corruption sanctions would only be appropriate where there is UK jurisdiction, if for some reason UK law enforcement bodies are unable to pursue criminal proceedings against the perpetrators or some other kind of proceedings against the property. And this includes because of a lack of law enforcement cooperation with foreign jurisdictions. But when it comes to foreign law enforcement proceedings, the note speaks only of the possibility of foreign law enforcement action, which it says would not rule out UK sanctions, and that particular attention would be given to cases where local law enforcement authorities are unwilling or unable to take action. But it is strangely silent on whether sanctions are appropriate where foreign law enforcement proceedings are actually in train. And moving on to another problem with the same documents, the information note in particular to NGOs and civil society, it in includes a checklist for these um, civil society organizations which has recently been supplemented by NGO produced templates for so-called Magnitsky sanctions submissions, which you can download from the website of the charity Redress. And interestingly, the template encourages wide dissemination of completed case files. So not just submitting 
your submissions to the UK, but also submitting it to other countries. And indeed, in the UK, not stopping at the Foreign Commonwealth and Development Office, but also submitting the same information to the law enforcement authorities. Um, again, not limited to the UK, but also um, in particular, the US law enforcement authorities and immigration authorities. Now, what's wrong with that, you say? Well, that's all very well if there is transparency in the designation process. And in particular, if there is transparency about the extent to which that type of evidence is relied on, and perhaps most importantly, if there is transparency about the ownership and control structure and funding position of the NGOs and the civil society organizations that make these submissions. I'm going to skip over some of the points that hopefully will come up in questions, but I want to also flag that these designation grants are clearly very broad and they cover uh, an enormous amount of activity, uh, deliberately so, and it is early days. We have yet to really see what kind of um, issues arise in both the designation process and in the course of challenging sanctions, but there are some obvious problems with the way that the system has been designed from a sanctions challenge perspective. And that's my third point. There is a clear due process deficit here as well. Problem number one is that the review that would happen regardless of whether you bring a challenge or not automatically is far less frequent than it is in the EU. In the EU, you have annual reviews. In the UK, you have every three years. Problem number two is the ouster clause that was inserted into the Sanctions and Anti-Money Laundering Act when it was passed a few years ago now, which required designated persons to first seek ministerial review of their designations before they can be scrutinized by any court. And then only um, the judicial scrutiny is by way of appeal against the minister's decision on review. And I say that it's early days in the UK because we don't know yet if there have been any ministerial review applications so far. There is no public visibility over exercises of the review process. It's only once a minister has reached a decision that it is then for the minister to decide whether to publish or publicize the decision. And to compound this problem, there's no time limit for the minister to reach a decision on a request for varying or revoking a designation. A minister only has to decide as soon as is reasonably practicable, and the clock starts ticking once the minister is considered to have received the information he needs for making the decision. And then finally, you only have one bite of the cherry, because once a request has been made of the minister and decided, no further request can be made unless you can point to a significant matter which has not previously been considered by the minister. Problem number three, and this is something we can say already, uh, there is a problem of principle baked into this process. If it was intended to operate fairly, then why is there no provision that confers a clear entitlement on the designated person to access the material on which their designation is based? In other words, how can you challenge your designation if you do not have full access to the evidence that it is based on. Problem number four, even when you do get in front of a judicial body on a review, sorry, on an appeal against a minister's decision on review, there are provisions that allow the evidence to be withheld from the designated 
person in accordance with the so-called closed material procedure that was first developed for terrorist related designations. And this is not new as such because there is a, a corresponding provision in the EU court. But the difference here is, of course, that the, the UK process superimposes this ministerial review before you even get to the court. And problem number five, which is the final problem, um, SAMLA, the Sanctions Anti-Money Laundering Act, limits the scope for recovering damages to circumstances where you can establish or where the court is satisfied that there has been negligence or bad faith in connection with the designation. I said that was the final problem, but um, I lied. <laughs> there is one very, very um, important caveat to all this, because we're talking about a process that is going to be expensive and you need to pay lawyers. And how do you do that if you are a designated person? Well, you have to apply for a legal expenses license. And who do you apply for? Uh, that, sorry, who do you apply to? You apply to the Treasury, i.e. the very body that you are going to challenge in due course. And it is for the Treasury to decide, A, whether to grant the license in the first place, and B, if it grants the license, how much you are allowed to pay for your lawyers. So I leave you with that note and welcome any questions. Excellent. Uh, thank you, Anna. And I think the points you made there about the relationship between sanctions and uh, existing criminal justice measures kind of building off what, uh, what Adam was saying is really an important one, because it does seem as though in many scenarios, sanctions could be used as an easier way to free someone's assets than going through the rigmarole of criminal process. But of course, it all depends on the sanctions framework in a particular country. I think actually one of the suggestions in uh, Jeffrey's submission to Parliament was that sanctions should operate on a fairly high standard of proof, which would be the balance of probabilities, which is different from the standard of proof used in a number of other countries that make it easier to impose sanctions. But I was wondering, Jeffrey, if you would like perhaps to quickly respond to some of the due process objections to sanctions, because obviously you've put in quite a lot of thought into how to make sure that the process for imposing sanctions is fair and is not really vulnerable to well-founded due process critique that uh, Anna has just been laying out. And as you do that, um, I was also hoping that we could package into that one of the questions that came uh, through Q&A, uh, which I think is best addressed to you, about whether other countries have independent bodies that make sanctions decisions, going back to your proposal for Australia to have such a body. Would that be in line with uh, current practice? Or would that be a bit of an outlier? They're really separate questions, but dealing with Anna's Points. I do, in fact, say in my book, a law that aims to assist the protection of human rights should not, by definition, impinge upon them. So due process is important and uh, has not been properly addressed by any Magnitsky law to date, including the joint committee proposals, which I think are in other ways uh, excellent. The first point, as you picked out, Anton, is the burden of proof. The test in US and other countries is simply availability of credible evidence. <laughs> and I'm too old a hand at criminal justice to uh, note that, or not to note, that evidence that appears credible is uh, quickly rendered incredible in many cases. So I think there needs to be a proper burden of proof, uh, not to the criminal standard, but to the civil standard of the balance of probabilities. Then uh, no double jeopardy. Uh, there is uh, I think a mistake in the American approach, which frequently sanctions people who are already on trial. I think that's, a, uh, that's unnecessary for a start, 
puts them in double form of double jeopardy and uh, should not be permitted if if there is action being taken against them in their own or another country. There must be reasons, not in the sense of a judicial decision, but there must be sufficient reasons to explain to the public why. And most importantly, there must be uh, a prospect of uh, a fair appeal either to an independent body or to a court. That seems to be beyond DFAT's ken. It doesn't really uh, go into how you can provide for a proper appeal system. But in Britain, of course, you have judicial review and have pointed out some problems with the minister making the initial decision, but uh, I think even judicial review is a limited power. It doesn't, it addresses more procedures than merits. So there should be a proper system of appeal. So there are just a few of the points and obviously a mature Magnitsky law, which, uh, and, and we're in early stages but ought to comprehend. Thank you. And would you like to address the point about independent bodies? Sort of what's the, the genesis of that idea? Is that something that is common practice? Well, that is something that has come about and was accepted and proposed by the Joint Committee. It took a lot of evidence on the subject and decided that it was necessary to have a expert and independent body as uh, to accredit the decisions to recommend to the minister who wouldn't be obliged to accept the recommendations but uh, it would come with uh, the strength of independent expertise uh, this is available in some human rights sanctioning of the European Union. It is well, public participation is welcomed in America where they've got uh, up to a thousand people in the sanction section of the State Department. They have 250 individual sanctions at the moment. And there are handbooks on how, what time to make your for human rights organizations to participate in the process. So there's actually a welcoming of public involvement in the American Magnitsky process, which uh, is going to be frozen out if DFAT gets its way here. Okay, thank you. Uh, we've got a question about some of the... Uh political circumstances and vicissitudes that might uh, affect the fate of the legislation. So probably a question to you, Adam. Do you think that if the ALP gets in at the next election, the government might change its position regarding explicit references to human rights and an independent committee? Uh, well, that's a good question. And this comes back to that sort of crystal ball gazing that uh, you alluded to at the beginning, Anton. The ALP are going to have other things on their agenda. They're, they're going to have you know, eight years out of office, possibly nine years out of office, um, if they win the next election, which is a, which is a big if. Um, it will be down. It will, it, it's one of those topics that I think will be pushed down the agenda very, very rapidly. Um, there are other political issues that will grasp their attention. Um, accelerating response to climate change, for example, would be pretty high up that agenda. Um, sorting out the economy post-pandemic or managing the pandemic as it goes on, I think will be far higher on the agenda. When they get to this, I think they would be likely to go with an independent committee. Um, it's sort of the heart and soul of the Labor Party to have that sort of committee to make a collective kind of recommendation. Um, and it gives 
a minister, if if it's if it's a quiet recommendation from the committee to the minister, there's nothing public about public about it. It gives the minister to accept or decline upon their advice. Of course, so many things in Canberra these days with the advent of mobile phones leaks like a sieve. So you'd be very, very careful about um, rejecting advice from a committee because you can't guarantee that all committee members will be as quiet as possible. People tweet from cabinet these days, which I just find <laughs> abhorrent, but um, it happens. So, yeah, I, I couldn't see it being a high priority, but when they get to it, I think an independent com committee um, would certainly be there. And explicit references to human rights, I think, would also be part of the agenda as well. So I think both parts of that question would be a, a resounding kind of yes, but definitely don't hold your breath. Um, and depending on what how the, how the election result comes, comes out as well, when you have a clear mandate, a whole lot of stuff can move through the parliament very, very quickly. But if you're if you if you, if you're bogged down with one or two people um, making the difference between being in power or not, as we've more or less had for for a number of years now in Australia, uh, different decisions are made, different politics comes into play. We'll wait and see. I'm, I can be patient. Thanks. We've also got uh, a comment rather than a question, but I think there's a question implicit in there. The comment is that in regard to criminal sanctions against individuals in companies, say Australian, extreme care must be taken to ensure high level management who initiated the criminal activity are charged rather than some lower level personnel. Um, and I think that probably goes to sanctions as well, right? So we want to go after people who are actually responsible for the violations rather than low level uh, targets who are just easier to get. And I think this is where you've got the political dilemma of on the one hand, you want your sanctions to be meaningful, but on the other hand, you don't necessarily want to rock the diplomatic boat of state and uh, engage in a diplomatic rift with another country who'd be upset. Um, so I was wondering, how, how should one navigate that dilemma? How does one deal with that? And maybe we go first to Anna for, for your reflections on how the other countries kind of try to deal with that from your experience. I think if we look at the policy note that the UK government produced for both corruption and human rights sanctions, they do uh, address this point in the sense that, as I mentioned, the grounds for designation are incredibly broad and they include not only anyone who is an involved person, but also associates of involved persons. Now, low level employees could potentially fall under both of those. Um, but they do say in the policy note that they will take into account the role that the particular person played and whether this is an incredibly interesting point whether they did anything to mitigate the damage whether they blew the whistle whether they alerted anyone to it whether at the time or afterwards and perhaps that is one way of addressing this particular dilemma but it touches on a uh, very um, interesting other consideration, which is that it is well known, at least in the UK, that uh, there have been real problems with prosecuting companies for corruption and other related offences, due in part to the difficulties, the perceived difficulties of applying the um, corporate liability test in the UK in practice. And I think from a personal perspective, um, it isn't just the fact that sanctions are an efficient and effective way of freezing assets that make them so attractive and popular. It is perhaps also because of uh, the convenient way that they offer to deal with instances of corruption otherwise than through the law enforcement process, which has resource resource challenges as well as legal uh, challenges once cases get to court. So I dare say we'll see more, yeah. more use for, from that perspective. Jeffrey, go ahead. 
Yeah, well, I was saying the best example of this is the crown prince of Saudi Arabia. Every Magnitsky sanction law thus far has sanctioned 16 individuals responsible for the brutal murder of the journalist, Mr. Khashoggi. Now, <laughs> they range from the doctor who cut him up to the consul and the uh, individuals who captured him, but not the crown prince who gave the order on any view of the evidence. There's, uh, it's not just credible, but would be uh, satisfy the burden of proof that the crown prince gave the order and no government is, has the guts to sanction him. There's another ruler of Dubai who's in and out of the English courts at the moment, uh, convicted by judges anyway, uh, civil proof of uh, arranging the kidnap of his daughters and uh, the <coughs> surveillance of his ex-wife. Uh, he would be an obvious candidate for Magnitsky listings were he not a great friend of the Queen and shares her box at Newmarket on many an occasion. He runs most of his horses in Britain. So that is uh, the sort of dilemma that diplomats, whether in the British Foreign Office or in DFAT, simply want to hide under the bed when it comes along. But I think ultimately we must be faithful to the human rights foundations of this exercise and not be distracted by foreign policy concerns. And if there is uh, overwhelming evidence that these people are involved in uh, human rights abuses of a serious nature, uh, we must proceed. Uh, thank you. Adam, anything from you to add on this point? Um, look, with the dealing with people at, at lower levels, it's... I think people at lower levels, uh, if we take that attitude that we shouldn't deal with people at lower levels because the, director, the, the people who directed are the, the real evil people, we end up with the Nuremberg defense all over again. You know, it's like, uh, I know I was bribing somebody. Um, I knew I could have blown the whistle, but you know, it was my job and that's, you know, I'm pretty good at my job. So I think it's it's a top to bottom thing. And when you look at organizations, if an, if an organization is operating that way, it's part of the organizational culture. People know, they know with a nod and a wink that, you know, they should, throw a bribe in somewhere, they don't necessarily get directed. The expectations, the rewards they get for securing contracts and the like far outweigh the kind of risks that are involved. And, you know, there's there's many, many examples around the world of corporations um, that end up with that kind of culture. And, I mean, there are some changes in the wind as well. Uh, some of the... Foreign Corrupt Practices legislation um, and the British Bribery Act puts an onus on corporations to have genuine anti-corruption measures built in at, and, and encourages self-reporting. So if somebody lower level is doing something wrong, a corporation has got the ability to self-report. So there's, there's, there's bits and pieces um, to a very complicated jigsaw puzzle here. But I think sort of just saying we should only target the top people would then end up with corporations just going, well, let's make sure it's only middle managers that are doing stuff. You know, and then we, we know we're not going to get sanctioned. We're not, we know we're, we're, nobody's going to take foreign bribery action or anti-corruption action against us because we've left it with the middle. We, we've left it up to middle management. We trust them to, to do what we expect them to do, which is wrong. Thanks. Uh, there's a bit of an explosion in our Q&A box. I struggle to keep up with the pace of questions, but unfortunately, we've only got a couple of minutes left. We do have to wrap up this discussion soon. There's just one question that I, I've been meaning to ask. I think it's, it's quite an interesting aspect of sanctions regimes, that some of them allow sanctioning family members of the main target as well as the actual perpetrator. 
And obviously, that's a dramatic difference from the world of criminal justice, and not all sanctions regimes do that. So the U.S. Magnitsky legislation does not actually envisage sanctions against family members. But I was curious as to the panelists' thoughts about how do we approach sanctioning sons for the sins of their fathers. Mm -hmm. um, so whoever would like to take that. Yeah, I'll certainly be happy to deal with that with a reminder of what Boris Nemtsov, the great Russian dissident now assassinated, said in relation to Putin's involvement in poisoning people in Britain, ex-spies and the like. He said, if you want to stop Putin from uh, killing people on your territory, uh, you stop his oligarch mates sending their children to Eton, which they do. And it's never been a problem for me, despite the biblical injunction about sins of the fathers, because I remember doing a corruption inquiry. I was special counsel to a royal commission looking at the sale by Israeli mercenaries of guns to the Medellin cartel used to kill uh, their political enemies. And I, after cross-examining this Israeli ex-general who was responsible, uh, he came up to me and said, please don't name me in your report. I only did it for my family. And that's a motive for an awful lot of the corruption and abuse in the world. I only did it for my family. So I think it's fair enough to stop uh, families from going to hospitals in the West or going to um, universities in Australia if and usually they are the beneficiaries of the kind of conduct that we want to deter. Thank you. Uh, Adam Orana, anything from you on that? Anna, I've, I've got something to say, but Anna? I, I, just to say that I did a quick scan of the, the designations adopted so far in the UK, and there's only one <laughs> that I could find, which is the husband of a judge um, who approved the fraudulent uh, scheme in the Magnitsky case. And I think there's a reason for this, and this is because the EU court has been very uh, sceptical to how far you can extend uh, the circle of associates uh, for for designation purposes. And it is something that the UK has indirectly <laughs> signaled that um, it shares because when the misappropriation uh, regime designations were carried over uh, into the UK post Brexit um, or the expiry of the Brexit transition period, um, none of the um, designations under the Egypt um, regime were, and I suspect that's because there were only wives um, largely left. So I think yeah. that um, there could be um, some, some problems in the courts, <laughs> let's put it that way. Okay. Um, from a practical point of view, I think targeting the sons I take Jeffrey's point. I take Jeffrey's point here, but targeting the sons and daughters can have unintended consequences. And from an investigative point of view, um, Facebook has been an investigator's friend. We get these sons and daughters of officials who are on salaries of maybe fifty thousand US dollars, um, photographing themselves partying on daddy's yacht in the Bahamas, um, which begs the question, how did Daddy afford a $12 million yacht in the Bahamas? And this sort of evidentiary um, gathering has actually been used quite successfully in identifying uh, corrupt individuals. So maybe the sanctions after they've been identified and take the yacht away, but we just need to think through that we're not going to end up with some sort of unintended consequence and we end up cutting off our nose to spot our face. But generally speaking, I think um, the children, if they're benefiting, they shouldn't be benefiting from other people's misery. They shouldn't be benefiting from the theft of public assets. They shouldn't be benefiting um, 
whether they know what what their parents are up to or not. I think it should we should be shutting that down. Okay, well, I'm afraid this is all we've got time for today. So thank you very much to our panelists, Jeffrey Robertson QC, Dr. Anna Bradshaw and Dr. Adam Masters. Thank you also to the team at the College of Law and Trick who are working behind the scenes. So that's uh, Tom Furen, Jen Teo and Jeff Ainsketh. And thank you to all of you for tuning in to listen this evening. Goodbye for now. <laughs>